Okay, our next speaker is Professor Francesco Capuccio, who is uh, the Kefalon Chair of Cardiovascular Medicine at Warwick Medical School. And Professor Capuccio, his research interest is in cardiovascular epidemiology. He's done a lot of work in terms of salt and potassium in the determination of population risk and metabolic abnormalities in cardiovascular risk. He's also the past president of the British and Irish Hypertension Society. And he has done a lot of work as well in the area of obstructive sleep apnea, which I thought was very topical because we have lots of patients with it. Uh, we often don't know how to manage them well, and they clearly um, confer a, a level of cardiovascular risk. So we're delighted to have you, Professor Capuccio. Stage is yours. Thanks. Well, thanks very much, uh, Jacob. Um, I'm taking you to a different territory now. Um, <clears throat> And that's the management of cardiovascular risk in obstructive sleep apnea. That's the title I was given. However, before going into the clinical setting, I want to put this in a, in, in a bigger context. And that is the one of the role of sleep in chronic disease. Um, sleep until uh, the Second World War was really territory for uh, psychology, psychiatrists, uh, or, or psychotherapists. And it was quite esoteric. After the Second World War, we started having the signs uh, moving up quite rapidly uh, with several steps in the understanding of the role of sleep, the mechanism to regulate sleep, the chronobiology. And um, the research started stepping up in, in chronobiology. The clinical setting has been focusing on very rare conditions that affect sleep. And um, until more recently, when we went into um, the interest in the uh, larger effect of sleep on our health, in life, and just as a reflection, uh, is a fact that we, get, we spend a third of our lives asleep. And yet, until recently, no one paid attention to what uh, sleep or disturbed sleep does on our health and um, uh, ill health. So, until recently, these guys came to the fore with a Nobel Prize for the discovery of the molecular mechanism controlling the circadian rhythm. And suddenly the interest in sleep has exploded both in science, in the lay media, and in blogs and bloggers. And I want just to introduce you to this very, very few concepts that we have accumulated over the last 10, 15 years of the role of sleep and the disturbance of sleep in, in relation to health before getting into the clinical setting. Um, if you ask yourself, how much do we need in terms of sleep, we don't have an answer. What we can see is how much in general modern societies sleep. So we take epidemiology as a reference point, and this is a national representative study in Britain of self-reported duration of sleep uh, for men and women. And you can see that the duration of sleep people have, have a, a, a normal curve with a peak at about six to eight hours. And then we have a significant proportion of people either side of the tail that are either, let's say, call it by um, um, just for convenience, short sleepers or long sleepers. All right, and we will hear this definition quite often, but has the same relevance as talking about hypertensives or hypercholesterolemics. So this is a frequency distribution that is cut in some categories. Let's say the normal sleepers sleep in general between six and eight hours per night. Does it apply to everywhere else? Yeah, well, this is American data, national American data. You find that the peak is eight hours. And do you find why is it eight hours and not seven? Because the survey was done over the weekend. So that already shows that somebody catches up at time and may hint on the fact that sleep is genetically determined somehow. We have a chronotype but is influenced by external cues. Let's call it the environment. Now, does it matter whether you sleep less than the norm, the norm or more than the norm? Well, this is what we call an ecological association. So stay away from cause-effect relationship. But it's a clear description by Andrew Steptoe of a study where he plotted through a multinational study, the average duration of self-reported sleep of a bunch of adolescents, um, university students across different parts of the world. So each dot is the average for a group of students, adolescents and young adults. Um, and on the y-axis is the self-reported poor health. 
And we can find here, I plotted it, he did a, a table, but I plotted it, and immediately you find that there is a range of self-reported hours of sleep within which the poor, um, um, uh, the self-reported poor health is about stand, uh, um, stable. But then as you go below a certain level, this tends to rise. And I plotted that is, uh, at, at the time was an interest that all these countries are in the Far East. And does it, does it show any causal effect relationship? Absolutely not. We can't control for confounders. So a long time ago, with a colleague of mine, we started a program of sleep epidemiology, not very well known at the time. And we wanted to ascertain whether there was any relationship at all between the duration of sleep, as well as the quality of sleep later on, and any of the long-term conditions that we were interested in traditionally, and we focus on cardiometabolic disease because that was our interest. So the first thing we bumped into is was a historical decline in sleep duration in America. They had the longest data from 1910 to about the 70s, and the parallel rise in obesity. Again, ecological association, and we were curious to see, having seen some experimental data suggesting um, the effect of short sleep or metabolic aspects, and whether there could be an association between these two. So we run a meta-analysis of all, uh, all, um, all cross-sectional studies in populations of um, young adults and um, children and young adults um, on the relationship between the duration of sleep and the, the um, prevalence of obesity or BMI. These are cross-sectional studies. And what we found very clearly, that when plotting these in a meta-analysis, there was a very high indication that those who were short sleepers were more likely to be obese, um, and also in adults, with an odds ratio was quite high, irrespective of the statistical significance given the very large number. But we were wondering whether that would indicate anything at all. And we bumped immediately into what we call the risk or reverse causality or bidirectionality of effect, in which sleep research falls very well into. In other words, there, are, there was possibility that, short, that sleep deprivation sustained over time through mechanisms that were known in experimental studies to occur, like increase in glucose intolerance, reduction in insulin resistance, increasing appetite through the effect on leptin and ghrelin could lead to high energy intake and also the increasing fatigue, activation of inflammatory markers and sedentary lifestyle could lead to reduced energy expenditure. And that would explain the causal pathway whereby sleep deprivation could cause obesity. But on the other hand, we know that people with obesity suffer from sleep disorder breathings they have activation also of inflammatory cytokines and affecting the brain, and that could be the reverse causality. So we went to see whether we could prove the same thing and find the same effect in prospective studies, where the duration of sleep was assessed prior to the development of obesity or weight gain, and then the population was followed over time and see what weight gain or incidence of obesity was found. And without going into great detail, we found that in children, the relative risk of developing obesity um, falling into the category of um, short sleep for their age norm was quite high, being plausible with a cause effect relationship in terms of time dependence. I have to cut the story very short here because the next step was a program of analysis of all prospective studies relating duration of sleep and outcome, either incidence of risk factors or uh, vital outcomes. And this is just a summary of our studies over time. And we found that in adults and children, obesity included children as well, these were all studies in adults, the short sleepers were more likely to develop conditions like hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, type 2 diabetes, and also um, <clears throat> develop fatal and non-fatal coronary heart disease, strokes, and in fact, something that created some discussion at the time, we found a reduction in life expectancy in short sleepers in a very large epidemiological studies. These meta-analyses uh, included at that time nearly 1.3 million um, participants. Now, 
there were uh, intervention studies of short-term randomized trials of sleep deprivation that shows very clearly that the mechanisms involved in the development of obesity and diabetes and blood pressure are consistent with the long-term findings. And if you deprive people of sleep in a, in a laboratory experiment, although in a short term, obviously, you cause glucose intolerance, you cause an increase in insulin resistance, you cause a rise in blood pressure, which is reversible by returning to prolonged sleep duration. So reversible effects, which if sustained over time, could be compatible with the effect we saw prospectively. What is important then, so short sleep duration leads uh, or it predisposes, possibly in a causative fashion, to the development of cardiometabolic chronic disease. Now, is it important when you sleep? Well, the answer is yes. It's not only important you sleep a certain amount of time, but it's also when you sleep. And that is mainly to avoid the falling into a the synchrony between your sleeping time and your uh, chronotype. We are all programmed to sleep when it's dark and when it's night for us, and to be awake when it's light. In fact, if you travel transmeridionally and you go to Australia, it will take a long time before you adapt to the new wave. Otherwise, you suffer what is what we call a jet lag, a desynchrony or um, um, a misalignment means exactly in, in chronobiology terms, jet lagging. So if you don't do that, you suffer what the shift workers suffer, which is the same increase in cognitive disease. Now, uh, if you don't sleep well, um, you, you can sleep um, less, and that's the quantity. We were also interested in the quality of sleep. And one of the quality measure is the number of arousals. I'm very puzzled by this very latest study published when the number of arousals a night in a large population studies here is directly associated with the incidence of cardiovascular disease. And these are four samples for three long-term prospective American studies where they looked at the measurement of uh, sleep features. And this is done by polysonography, a very high yield and high specific measure of sleep um, factors. Now, when we talk about quality, the commonest measure of quality of sleep is insomnia. This is the, the commonest symptom the GPs are reported to. And uh, the, the question studying insomnia in relation to our uh, design of prospective, try to look at whether sleep disturbance may cause disease, is quite tricky. Because insomnia is the common symptom for a variety of conditions, depression the first. Uh, any other conditions will cause insomnia. So that would be the reverse causality design. So it's very difficult to find. However, when you look at prospective studies, they've studied the measures of insomnia. Now, insomnia is measured by four different characteristics. The difficulty in initiating sleep, difficulty in maintaining sleep, the early morning awakening, or the non-restorative sleep, feeling tired when you wake up. And some of these symptoms we've all experienced, at least in the short term. Now, these symptoms when I, were associated in prospective studies to a stepwise increased um, risk of developing heart failure. This is a long-term longitudinal study. And it was in the cumulative effect, both in terms of that one or more symptoms had a greater dose response effect on the risk of de developing heart failure. Now, of interest, and that has been done before also between the quality and quantity that we did in a Whitehall study, and that's been repeated here. What they found here that the insomnia symptoms here are not mediated by duration of sleep, or in this case also by concomitant sleep apnea, and we'll touch that upon, but is additive, additional to duration, suggesting that the lack of quality of sleep adds to the risk, particularly for coronary events, to what the, the short duration of sleep does. So in our program, and then that fits with the latest results, we came with this, this graph that is, is continuously updated, in fact. But the, the, the point is that I want to make is, until we started this, sleep was a function of the brain. So a neuroscientist where 
the main interested people in, in, in this study. And the point you want to make has been made by the Nobel Prizes later on, when they discover the molecular mechanisms and the fact that clocks are not only present in the brain, like our central clock, but there are peripheral or slave clocks, we call it sometimes. They are regulated in each organ, tissue, and apparatus of the body. That sleep is not a function that resides in the brain only. But its presence is every single apparatus and organ. So you can desynchronize the connection between these clocks and you can lead to a number of, of alterations of the function. If you are a jet lag, one of the things you have sometimes people have gastrointestinal problems, for instance, you wonder why. And that's because the clock in your gastrointestinal system is desynchronized. So we, we created this link by trying to see the different effects of sleep deprivation and or quality, um, poor quality sleep to a number of our chronic conditions. So the, 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 the summary on the epidemiology of evidence uh, fulfills the criteria of Bradford Hill in our view to support the causality issue because the effects are very strong, there are large relative risks, they are consistent, they are confirmed in different populations on several endpoints. They have a temporal sequence, a short sleep precedes the endpoint, no prospective studies, shows a dose response. Um, and the biological possibility is given by the trials I haven't showed you in the short term. But there are uh, uh, dozens of those short term trials suggesting all the different mechanisms. We also found some prospective association with inflammatory markers, by the way. And the thing is reversible. At least in the short term, trials in blood pressure, diabetes, insulin resistance show that if you prolong sleep, you revert the abnormalities that you find. Now, once we're talking about the importance of sleep, there are classifications of conditions that are associated with sleep disturbances. And I won't go through all that. The majority are rare, specific, but there is one particular group where I've highlighted three conditions here. We're talking about insomnia. We have really glanced the sleep-related breathing disorders. It's not the objective today. But here fits the um, um, and the circadian rhythm of sleep weight disorder. This is related to shift work, for instance. Amongst the sleep related breathing disorders, we fit sleep apnea syndrome, or I would say sleep apnea. This is the commonest clinical condition associated with sleep disturbances. That's why we talk about that. And in training in medicine, sleep medicine has one and a half hour in, in UK medical curricula. And most of it is devoted to just sleep apnea. In our university, we, we offer 40 hours of sleep medicine across the four years of our medical curriculum. It's not just sleep apnea syndrome. Anyway, the cycle of sleep, of obstructive sleep apnea, very briefly for those who are not familiar, is that during the sleep, the upper ways relax, becomes a bit floppy, and on inspiration, they can collapse by stopping air for getting into your airways. So you tend to have a reduction in oxygen saturation or stoppage in, in, in oxygen. The breathing stops, you got the apnea, the oxygen fell, uh, falls, and then after a while, the CO2 starts the signal and you usually just snort and you wake up again. That is an arousal, it's not a waking up, it's an arousal. You usually are not aware of it. But some of your partners may be aware of it. And so the person may not be aware, the breathing starts again, and the cycle goes. And this has consequences, you will see. Now, how we detect that? Now, I want to ask you, all practicing physicians, how many of you in an adult patient coming to your clinic, whether GP, um, blood pressure, diabetes, run these two tests? Do you run an early assessment of sleep apnea in every, let's say, 40 year plus individual? How many do that? How many do an Apple sleep and score? That's the tip of an iceberg, tip of an iceberg. I know all of you, you are super experts. You don't count. More, more normal jobbing doctors. You do. Okay, so if they report some symptoms, you take action. 
So you don't ask them to come back three, four times. Well, let's see whether you reflect the normal thing. And the airport sleepiness scale, do you know what it is? This is a questionnaire that is assessing excessive daytime sleepiness, not sleep apnea. And you know the stop bank questionnaire? That is the very first sign for you to suspect that there might be sleep apnea because snoring, feeling tired, observed apneas by the partner, high blood pressure, BMI over 35, age over 50, and neck circumference over 16 inches. How many of you measure the neck? No one. Uh, males. So these are what NICE now recommends in, in high-risk group to be carried out. Now, <clears throat> why is risky? Why are we worried about sleep apnea? We said what it is. That obviously beyond the, the hypoxia, which is definitely not a nice thing, and the arousals that we've seen epidemiologically, if they are continued, are already a predictor of, of um, cardiovascular disease, uh, cause you sleep fragmentation, so bad quality of sleep, uh, higher blood pressure, particularly at night, so nocturnal hypertension, and fatigue, excessive data sleepiness, often, not always, and low quality of life. So these are the effects. And what are the mechanisms? Well, a variety of mechanisms. I won't go into great detail. Obviously, from the cardiometabolic effects to the blood pressure, nocturia and night sweats are quite common. We're discussing it. Sometimes you sweat, you, 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 you test for pheochromocytoma, but it's not, it's sleep apnea. Uh, and there are a number of uh, mechanisms. The most obvious is sympathetic activation that you can physically see by some symptoms. What are the consequences if untreated, unknown and untreated? Prospectively, I'll show the data. They do predict epidemiologically an increase in all cardiovascular diseases, not only the, the blood pressure related and our, with our failure, not only the, let's say, inflammatory or vascular related like stroke or myocardial infarction, but also arrhythmia, a sudden death. What's the evidence? Prospective study, this is just one. The incidence of hypertension increases stepwise with the degree of severity of obstructive sleep apnea. And the all cause mortality increases with the degree of severity of sleep apnea. What is the severity of sleep apnea? How do we diagnose sleep apnea? Very briefly, the gold standard is the overnight polysonography, only done in highly specialist centers, very expensive. Uh, the current clinical is what we call the short overnight test, sometimes referred to as polygraphy. It's really a little gadget you wear at night, you're given to you, you, you bring it home, and you record airflow, oxygen saturation, sometimes the venter to the effort, and you bring it back. And the grading is done on the apnea hypopnea index, so the number of apneas or hypopneas that occur uh, in an hour. And you can say moderate to severe is about 15, severe is about 30. If you also have excessive daytime sleepiness, only if you have excessive daytime sleepiness, you can assess with the Epworth or with other uh, where you fall asleep at the wheel or other things, then we call it sleep apnea syndrome. It has implications for the DVLA, HEB, driving license, and so forth. How do we treat? I won't go in great detail here. I wasn't just the objective, although. But there are general measures. CPAP is the current treatment, although there are some surgery or oral appliances you can have to increase, to, to modify the breathing of, uh, anatomically. But in general, the continuous pr uh, positive airway pressure is the standard therapy. And that basically is a machine that pumps air at a high pressure. No, it's not oxygen machine. Um, these have been used during the COVID period for the less serious cases uh, in, instead of ventilators when we are in crisis. What are the five reasons identified by the British Lung Foundation to take this quite seriously? I'll go through br briefly, common and underdiagnosed condition. It doesn't seem very common here at the moment. Closely linked to other serious health problems. The awareness levels are low. 
the risk and service levels vary across the UK, although the street of industry forward is cost effective and saves NHS millions. Let's go through all these. Common. The number of adults is 330,000 at the moment are treated. It's estimated to be half of what it should be. Recent evidence suggests 85% of people with OSA in the UK are undiagnosed and therefore untreated. For those who are diagnosed, only half are treated. We did a little survey in Coventry in preparation for a grant that I'll talk about in a moment. And from regular system of seven general practice, we found that 1.3% over the age of 18 in general practices had a diagnosis coded or sleep apnea. The estimated from epidemiology, but it's only estimated, should be 6%. Only 8.8% in those records had, uh, in the high risk group, men and women over the age of 50 with obesity and hypertension and lower diabetes, which we consider a high risk group. It, only 8.8% were listed as having sleep apnea syndrome. Well, the estimates at the moment are between 15 and 30%, depending on which population. They're closely linked to health problems. So sleep apnea syndrome, in a bidirectional way, is currently associated with hypertension. Most people with sleep apnea have nocturnal hypertension. In the hypertension clinics, and I'm confronted with some of my colleagues, usually if you look for it, you diagnose at least one patient every session you do. So there is a comorbidity. Diabetes, high level comorbidities with type two, with um, obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. And in fact, in prospective randomized con controlled trials, and this condition is the only one in which CPAP has been proven to be effective in reducing outcomes. One of the lack of evidence is that although the prospective epidemiology is very supportive, the intervention is not. Obesity, arrhythmias, heart failure, stroke, coronary heart disease, and pulmonary hypertension. So high level comorbidities of all the things that we know now are the burden that lead to uh, cardiovascular events. What is the awareness? The awareness amongst people and patients in the survey in 2014, 15 from the British Health Foundation, 42% of people whose know or whose partners knows have never heard of the term sleep apnea. More worrying is the awareness amongst general practitioners or doctors in general, apart from us gurus that are here. 85% <laughs> uh, of people later diagnosed with OSA went to their GP about their symptoms. So well done to you that if it comes to you, you immediately do the test. But 11% were told not to worry, or were given advice and no action was taken. 20% visited their GP on three or more occasions with their symptoms before being taken seriously. And 7.5% visited GP five times before being taken seriously. So that could be a measure of lack of awareness, if not lack of willingness. But I, I believe in the first. Um, and risk and service levels vary across the UK. Let's see, obviously, it's important to see where you make a diagnosis and what facilities you have. We said that the diagnosis is made by a suspicion, it could be done in primary care, but you need to have a proof, which is a, an instrumental proof through a sleep center. So there are significant variations in the prevalence of estimates of OSA. The total units we have in this country, at least up to some years ago, were 289. They're plotted here, in these dots, but they're unevenly distributed. There are areas with no sleep centers at all. If you're in North Wales, I think the one in Bangor, I know, but there is nothing else here in the middle. Um, and in some large urban areas, there are nine or more. Of course, you want to work out by density of population, but that's not the only measure that counts because distance and access to services is the other problem. You might find that if you live in more, live in more rural areas, and has been shown in this survey that the population age in more rural areas was older than one in urban areas, um, you have less access to the sleep centers, so less diagnosis, and those are the people that probably need most, the older. And finally, the treatment is straightforward. CPAP is available. It's cost-effective. I'll give you some numbers here. I don't want to spend time here. 
increase the probability of survival. And an analysis on the NHS will lead to a 55 million saving at 40K qualities if all OSA patients were treated compared to none. However, if all were treated compared to what they're treated now, these would be the savings. And we're treating about less than half, 45% of what they should be. Remember they also, excessive daytime sleeps lead to road traffic accidents. And this adds to the cost effectiveness of outcomes related to health, although they're through traffic accidents. And also they improve productivity. And finally, there's one thing is unmeasured and unquantified in terms of money that increases the quality of life. You only have to have patients that go before and after CPAP to tell you how well they feel after that. Now, three more minutes to introduce what we are going to do about this at work. We've just been starting, awarded and starting a, a trial called FOUND. And I want to just very briefly introduce it to you. It's just started on the 1st of November. It's called Finding Obstructed Sleep Apnea Using a Novel Device. But what I've said, what one of the, one of the bottlenecks, particularly after COVID, we found that before COVID, to access a diagnosis in a sleep center would take three to six months if you have a sleep center around you. After COVID, the swamped, and um, these departments have been swamped, particularly the respiratory, now we have six to 12 months waiting for a test. The test is also difficult to, to, to program. So these people are now facing a long wait to have a diagnosis. So the time to diagnosis has become in, um, large. So we wanted to test the ability of moving the diagnosis outside sleep centers in a place that could be faster to use the time to diagnosis because there are lots of people in that bottom iceberg that need to be diagnosed. Uh, very briefly, this, the, the current pathway, for those not familiar, this is a usual diagnostic pathway. The patient sees a doctor, could be a GP or other specialist, and through the questionnaire, once it's identified, is referred to a sleep clinic. This is a block, may take three, six, 12 months, who knows? And then if the patient is able to do the test, the home sleep, 80%, they will have a sleep test and a diagnosis. If not, the patient have to uh, have an in-clinic sleep test, perhaps polygraphy or polysonography, so attend the hospital with a bed overnight, that would take longer. And about 50%, 45% would be diagnosed, whereas the other will not, and a few will have other diagnoses. So you have one in two hit with these. At the moment, as I said, this is a stumbling block. How do we bypass that? Um, the challenges for this at the moment are difficult to use. There are two stumbling blocks. One, you need to be able to carry out your polygraphy at home with your instructions. You have to be instructed by a staff to so attend the clinic, be uh, trained, go home, do the test, bring it back. Secondly, the, the tracer has to be scored by a technician. Through the, and they will take between one and two hours. So lots of time and cost. The manual scoring is expensive, can vary between three and 600 pounds a diagnosis of sleep apnea at the moment. Uh, it's a long waiting time, as I said, and the risk of contagion in COVID time now in sterilizing out the masks or the machines becomes quite, quite important um, also. Um, we're now testing a new device, which is validated against polygraphy, is approved in the EU, um, FDA approved, and is already in use in some sleep clinics in, the, in acute hospitals. And the idea is that you have a little medical device which is sent to you by post, sticks to your neck at night with, with written instruction, verbal instruction, and visual instruction on, a, on an iPhone that is mailed to you with this in different languages if necessary. You will wear it overnight. The, the, this device will record and beam through the um, cloud results to a center which is receiving it through an algorithm makes a real time diagnosis of sleep apnea and will send the, the referring doctor a report for them to take action. The test will take basically an hour, real time, one night, and um, uh, it will cost about 120 pounds at the moment. 
Now, we propose a new pathway with remote testing for case funding in primary care. We will identify patients through general practice within a high-risk group, we decided. So men and women over the age of 50 uh, with um, uh, BMI over 30, and either with hypertension, diabetes, or both. And we will compare to a usual care group, and we'll see what is the detection rate. The solution is to determine the feasibility, the diagnostic rate, and cost-effectiveness of this study. It's a multi-center individual randomized controlled trial. It's primary care-based, targeted testing with AcuPebble, this is the device, versus usual care. The, rise, the high risk patients without known OSA to start with will be the target group. And it's been powered to detect a 5% difference in detection of OSA. Remember, in primary care at the moment, 1.8 or 8%, ex expecting 15 to 30%. And uh, the feasibility phase will assess also fidelity and acceptability. And I think I want to conclude by saying that um, we started with the sleep being something uh, of, the, um, uh, of the brain. And I want to leave you with these two messages. Sleep disturbances in both quality and quantity um, should be considered an additional behavioral fac risk factor for cardiovascular disease in any preventive uh, strategy uh, plans. And um, it is surprising, and obviously, in the plans we heard this morning, and uh, in the cardiovascular disease prevention plans at the national level, um, sleep is hardly mentioned. But more importantly, sleep apnea is not mentioned. And sleep apnea should be an indicator of cardiovascular disease risk added to the other indicators. What is the problem? In general practice, I see there's only one code for snoring in the QOF, at least for England and Wales, I don't know in Scotland. But uh, so remuneration is not related to uh, indicators, and uh, there is no indicator for that, so you can't use it. And I think there is urgency now to include OSA as an indicator, whilst moving the diagnosis, I think, into primary care, with very little burden to primary care services, with obvious health economic savings, we will test in the trial, but it's obvious, and um, trying to change the pathway to increase the detection rates and uh, we left the possibility of shifting some of the resources spent in diagnosis into pumping more money to CPAP treatment for the future. Thank you.